when I start to discuss with, say, a triathlete about certain tests that might, they might do, for example, on a bike, they might do a functional threshold power test. Well, at the end of the day, if you're a stronger guy, your power output's going to be great. If you're a certain weight and you can put a certain amount of power into that bike, then if you're stronger, it's going to be higher. You're going to be able to hold higher power outputs and there's higher wattage on the bike because you're stronger. And the same applies for the rowing and the same applies for the swimming. Hello, I'm Jeff Sankoff, the Tri-Doc, an emergency physician, triathlon coach, and multiple Ironman finisher. And this is the December 15th, 2023 edition of the Tri-Doc Podcast, coming to you from beautiful, sunny Denver, Colorado. We are into the final couple of weeks of 2023. And as we sit on the precipice of a new year, I find myself looking back in amazement at a very busy and eventful triathlon season. It seems like just yesterday I was talking about the incredible performances at Oceanside, where Tamara Jewett and Frenchman Leo Berger stormed through really deep professional fields to impressive wins in the season opener. Throughout the year, there were plenty of races that featured similar deep professional start lists and some really incredible performances. We bore witness to events on the Ironman circuit and, to a much lesser extent, the PTO, where new faces and old gave us many thrills and spills. We saw unfortunate tragedy in Hamburg and in Cork, Ireland, and at all too many other swim courses that I care not to recount here. But we also saw triumph at the first ever men's world championships in Nice and the first ever women's only event in Hawaii, both of which were resounding successes. This year also saw the retirement of longtime greats Jan Ferdano, Sebastian Kinley, and Daniela Reef, as well as the passing of the baton from Ironman CEO Andrew Messick to an as yet unnamed successor. The world became a much more fragile place in 2023, be it because of climate change or geopolitics, but through it all, multisport endured, and thank goodness for that. When times are difficult at home and abroad, who doesn't want to be able to retreat into a personal space of selfish suffering, if only for an hour or two or three, and escape the external forces that tear at our sanity and peel away the last vestiges of our ability to remain level-headed and resist the temptation to constantly, perpetually succumb to moral outrage? For me, as we look ahead to what we can only hope will be a better 2024 for everyone, I for one remain happy that I have swim, bike, and run as a big part of my life. Although I may be in my brief off-season right now, training is always a big part of who I am, and I never stop that completely. I just kind of slow down a little and allow myself to rest and recover while fueling on maybe a little more red wine, brie, and cookies than I might at other times of the year. I hope that the holiday season allows all of you, my wonderful listeners, the opportunity to look back fondly at some multi-sport accomplishments that you're proud of as well. That can mean anything from making it through a tough workout to crossing a long sought-after finish line, or it could just mean successfully getting off the couch for the first time to push yourself to do something that you never thought was possible before. Whatever it is, I just hope that you're feeling a sense of contentment for what you've done and a hunger for more to come. Enjoy your holidays with family and friends and know that multisport and all of us who continue to find respite in this pretty crazy pursuit, well, we're all here with you and for you. And no matter where you are when you hear this, I know that I am wishing you many more start lines to come. Happy holidays. On the show today, Coach Juliet Hawkman and I have a special medical mailbag for you. Rather than answer a traditional medical question like we do most shows submitted by a listener, we provide some of our favorite holiday hacks in an effort to help you enjoy the holiday season while maintaining some sort of discipline related to your multi-sport goals. So grab a cup of hot scratch cider and your favorite protein bar, snuggle up by the fire, and stay tuned for that. It's coming right up. Later, I'm joined by Jason Curtis. Jason is a highly experienced strength and conditioning coach who has published more than a dozen books on the development of health, fitness, and sports performance. He's also the founder of the SCC Academy, which has qualified and upskilled over 20,000 fitness professionals and enthusiasts worldwide. He joins me to talk about the importance of strength training for triathletes, especially during the off-season, and gives his insights as to why it should be seen not just as a means of injury prevention, but also for achieving improved overall results. And that's coming up just a little bit later. 
Before all of that, I want to take a moment to thank all of my Patreon supporters of this podcast who have decided that for about the price of a cup of coffee per month, they could sign up to support this program and in so doing, get access to bonus interviews and other segments that come out about every month or so. The next of those episodes will be released next week and will feature a detailed medical segment on the evolutionary trade-offs that come with the use of highly engineered running shoes. That bonus episode and others like it are available on a private feed for all of my subscribers, including brand new subscriber Alex Snyder. Plus, for North American subscribers who signed up at the $10 per month level of support, they receive a special thank you gift in the form of a Boco TriDoc podcast running hat. So visit my Patreon site today at patreon.com forward slash Podcast and become a supporter so that you too can get access and maybe this cool gift as well. And as always, I thank you in advance just for considering. I should have some of those Santa bells because <laughs> it is our holiday edition of the Medical Mailbag. I'm joined once again by da, my da, friend da, da, and da, colleague. Da, da, yeah, da, da, exactly. Da, da, da. Right. <laughs> we uh, we will refrain from singing that song that would eliminate people from Whamageddon. So we won't do that one. Uh, I got eliminated. And we also won't talk about whether certain movies are Christmas movies or not. We're not. Oh, we, we probably should. We pro- <laughs> Anyways, we'll get back to all of that. Uh, my name, of course. Well, you know, you're listening to the TriDoc podcast. But uh, Juliet Hawkman, welcome back to the Medical Mailbag. Thank you. Always happy to be here and excited about this segment. Yeah, we uh, we have a special episode of the Medical Mailbag. We are not tackling a medical question per se on this episode. We thought that uh, being that we are coming to you just a few short days ahead of uh, Christmas and right at the end of Hanukkah, we thought that uh, we would bring you some of our personal holiday hacks. And, and why is this important, Juliet? Well, it's not the medical mailbag per se, but it is still chasing the holy grail of health here, right? So easy to, during the holidays, fall off of our habits that we established throughout the year in terms of eating well, drinking well, uh, training well, all the rest. And so it's super hard during the holidays, particularly if you live in northern climates, um, to kind of fall off good habits. So we're here to inspire and encourage you with some of our favorite hacks to kind of stay on the wagon or at least close to the wagon running behind the wagon uh during the next two weeks yeah and i think uh i want to also emphasize you know i i tell people all the time people ask me well do you do this all the time you train all year round and we have talked in the past about the importance of having an off season a period to recover and for many people and myself included this is that time and the fact that the holidays come sort of right in the middle of that is is always somewhat problematic because you're already not training at the same volume and intensity. And then, oh, a plate of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, right. it becomes that much harder to kind of stick with things. Uh, but it, it, it's, it, it's not impossible. And it is important to do as much as you can to try to at least stay within uh, some borders. Because when you do get started again, and for me, the date when I kind of get going again is generally around January 1st. It's a lot easier to do that if you can at least stick to some kind of consistency. So we're going to bring you some of our ideas. Yeah, some of our ideas. And I think, think, yeah, I think Jeff and I would agree that the overall message here is, you know, it is the holidays. Be good to yourself. It's okay to indulge a little. It's, It's an important time to prioritize family or partners or your loved ones or whoever you're with. Um, you know, I always think of my charming Victorian era grandmother. She used to say, you know, everything in moderation, including moderation. So it's okay to kind of splash out a little bit, but it's also good to have a plan going in so the wheels don't completely fall off the bus. Yeah, I think uh, that, uh, you know, we could almost just finish the segment right there because (laughs) I love that. I love that quote. I'm going to have to use that uh, going forward. Well, Juliet, what's your kind of first holiday hack that you recommend for people who want to enjoy the holidays, but want to do so in a way that keeps them at least somewhat focused on their multi-sport goals? Right. So I think that we can probably partition this conversation into two parts because you know, the first thing about the holidays is food and drink, right? Like that's the hardest part for many people about the holidays. And we were laughing before the segment about our mutual love of cheese <laughs> and how, <laughs> you know, the, the give me that hors d'oeuvre platter with cheese and crackers every single night and I'm just a dead duck. So, um, you know, let's talk about the obvious, the, the, the easy low wins first, uh, sort of portion control over the holidays. Now, 
you know, there was just a great article written by, you know, our fearless leader, Lance Watson, about allowing yourself to actually gain a few pounds in the off season and how that is important. So go ahead and lay on that Brie and, and uh, Camembert. But um, the way that I will approach, you know, sort of alcohol and my Achilles heel of food during the holidays is, you know, if I'm going to a party or even in my own house, if I've got all that good food in the fridge, you know, and it gets to that end of the day, I will sort of take one small plate and I'll say, okay, this is my portion control. Whatever is on this plate, this is my pre-dinner snack. Um, so it's a block of cheese, you know, eight to 10 crackers. Like that's how I do it. Because if I just put the whole thing out on a board, I'm history. I'll eat the entire box of crackers and the entire cube of cheese and, and it's all over. And similarly with, you know, alcohol, uh, sort of just decide ahead of time what your strategy is going to be. I'm going to have one drink. I'm going to have two drinks and then put the glass away. So you don't have that wine bottle that's constantly there, you know, being refilled or my current cheat right now is just having non-alcoholic options around that I really like. Like I really love San Pellegrino, like the, the, um, the flavored, you know, sodas or ginger beer, really high quality ginger beer. Yes, it's some sugar, but it's not alcohol. So those are sort of my cheats for the food and um, wine front. What about you, Jeff? Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I think uh, it's important to acknowledge that uh, we sacrifice during the year. I, when I'm training pretty much from January 1st until I have my last race, which this year was first weekend of December, I almost don't drink any alcohol. And I really enjoy wine. We have a very nice wine collection at home. I enjoy a glass of scotch every once in a while. Uh, it's not like I drink every day, but it, once I finish that last race, it's definitely nice to get back in to the wine cellar. Uh, my wife really likes it when I'm drinking wine with her. <laughs> as that, uh, she's not right. always having a glass by herself. So it is nice that uh, we can uh, share that together. But I agree with you. I think having that understanding that, you know what, I'm going to have one glass tonight, two glasses tonight, whatever it is. But then right. knowing that, you know, we don't have to, just because we open a bottle of wine, we don't have to finish it. And so we've totally. spent some money buying the, those preservative ways of being able to close a bottle and being able to know that when we go back to it, it's still going to be in good shape. Uh, that's 100%. one thing. Uh, wine I, has a shelf I, life. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, if you, if you are a wine drinker and you worry like that, like, oh God, once I open the bottle, it has to be drunk, then invest, get that as a Christmas gift for your spouse or significant other, get one of those, um, things that you can vacuum. buy where you vacuum out yeah you vacuum out the air and then you seal the bottle and then the bottle's good for another day so that that's a great way to get both a christmas gift for your significant other and also then for yourself so that you know you don't have to drink the whole bottle each time i also or you uh, can just be a agree. lot less concerned you can also be a lot less concerned about it like i am and that red wine bottle can sit on the counter for a good week easily <laughs> you... <laughs> true true uh the other thing is the non-alcoholic uh, uh, beverages, I 100% on board with that. I, uh, I, over the last couple of years, thanks to their sponsorship at all of our races, uh, the the non alcoholic beer. Uh, made by I, I, they do such a good job of sponsorship I can't remember their name I think athletic it's athletic brewing, brewing. Athletic brewing. yeah athletic brewing. so athletic yeah. brewing I, I've actually tried several of them and they're not bad I mean they are they are very passable as a, a non alcoholic beer I would never have said that in the past but now if I'm going out and that is an option that is something that I will avail myself of because alcohol it is just empty calories and uh, if that's something that you're conscious of then finding non-alcoholic options. The last thing I would say about drinking is uh, whenever I'm going out to an event, I make myself the designated driver. And I mm -hmm. know 100% then I'm only going to have one drink, maybe two over the course of a long evening. And uh, by making yourself the designated driver, then everybody else is looking to you to not drink. And so you are uh, therefore under, uh, you know, even more of a promise to yourself and others that you will be very controlled in your drinking. So it's another way of uh, making sure that you control your uh, – and, and you could still, again, you could still have a drink. You, you just have to – you're just putting yourself under uh, a constraint. So that's a good hack. I like that hack. Yeah, yep, that's good. All right. So let's move on from the, the uh, food and drink to sort of more the, the, the training stuff. You know, one thing that I suggest to my athletes during the holidays is, um, you know, so here's the training schedule for, as Jeff said, at this time of year, it's often pared down quite a bit because we are recognizing that we're rolling off a season and uh, we're giving everybody a bit of a break. Um, but this is all active recovery. It's not don't do anything for two weeks. <laughs> so, you know, 
look ahead to the time that you know you're going to be consumed with travel or family or children home from school on vacation or whatever it is, and just be super intentional about, okay, on this day, I'm going to get up an hour earlier and I'm going to get this trainer ride in because I know the rest of the day is going to be shot. Um, on this day, I'm going to make sure that I have a sitter to go to the pool so I can get to the pool that day. Um, on this day, I'm going to tag team with my partner so I can, you know, go for a run or whatever it is. So just really try to be intentional about planning. So you do have some consistency and you don't get to six o'clock every night and thinking, oh God, what happened to the day? You know, how the holidays took over and I didn't get anything in. Um, so that would be one thing is just really try to plan ahead a little bit. Yeah. And the other thing I often tell my athletes is this is a great time of year to explore other activities. So if you don't feel like uh, I'm not going to be able to bring my bike to go visit my family, I'm not going to have access to a trainer. That's okay. Maybe yep. this is a chance to go cross country skiing. Maybe this is a chance to go snowshoeing. I mean, there are, there are all kinds of things that we don't get to do because we spend all of our time swim, bike, run. Maybe this is a time you get to try something else. I have athletes who love to do rock climbing, and so they'll spend some of this time now going to their climbing gym and do some of that. Awesome. Is it is it super high-intensity endurance work? No. But is it great all-body strength work? Absolutely. And so I highly encourage exploring those kinds of things. Some of my athletes love to go play ice hockey or go skating. I mean, these are great activities that work different muscles, and boy, you feel it because you haven't been using yeah. them all year. Uh, but they are definitely activities that contribute to your overall sense of well-being and fitness and uh, can definitely substitute for your traditional swim, bike, run when you don't have access to that equipment because you're traveling or with family. And you can involve your yeah. family in doing those things. Yeah, 100%. And, and on the involve the family hack, um, you know, just it depends a little bit on the age of your kids, of course. But, you know, maybe when you go get the Christmas tree, you're running home, maybe – um, if you're in a warm climate, you, now the kids are home from school, you can go for your run and your kid can bike alongside you. Um, if you've got littler kids, littler kids love to jump in on sort of home functional strength sessions. You know, you can use them as sort of that overhead press. You can carry them when you're doing your monster walks if they're really little. So, and they love it. So include them in those, you know, Zwift is free for kids under 12. If you've got another, a second trainer, put your kid's bike on Zwift. They're used to that sort of game format or that game interface. They love to run a, ride along in New York City or you know Watopia with you as you sort of spin alongside. Um, so really try to think about how you might involve the kids in your training since they're home too, um, and uh, you know you're just looking to get the time in. So there's another idea. And then and I think oh, if, sorry yeah, sorry go, go ahead. ahead no go ahead Julia finish your thought. I was going to say and then the last one the last one I had. Um, is because you might have a little bit more time off from work, sort of consider it a little bit of a staycation. And yes, family and the holidays are the priority, but maybe there was that long run, which is a little bit further out of town that you haven't had the chance to do yet because you have to commute to get there. Or maybe if you're in a warmer climate, there's a bike ride that you haven't had time to do. Grab a friend and go and do that sort of you know exploration, fun, adventure run or ride or maybe it's a crazy set in the pool that you usually wouldn't have time for, or as Jeff says, cross country skiing, something like that. So sort of consider the next couple of weeks an opportunity to take advantage of a little bit of extra time where you might go and do something different from your sort of everyday day in day out schedule. Yeah. And on the subject of running, I wanted to kind of double down on that because a lot of people are running in colder environments. And you have to take into consideration the fact that winter running is not anywhere close to the same as summer running. As I think everybody knows, there was a funny post on uh, Facebook in one of the groups that I'm a member of where somebody said, hey, could people recommend their favorite gear for running when it's uh, below freezing? And I put treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very much a soft runner when it comes to running outdoors. That being said, <laughs> my son loves That's to run outdoors, and I will. Who lives in Colorado? <laughs> I know I've become soft, and I'm from Montreal, where I used to run outside in like negative ten all the time. Anyways, yeah. I, I I have become soft. I will run on the treadmill a lot, but I do like to still run outside when it's uh, not too bad. And I think when you are going to run out outdoors in the cold, you have to take into consideration the fact that, of course, it is colder. It is drier. 
higher and it is darker. You also have to remember that footing is also potentially an issue. And so all of those things need to come into play when you're thinking about your planning. You want to be sure that you're wearing layers. The base layer has to be warm, but it also has to wick away moisture. You then want to be able to have layers that are on top that could be either opened or easily removed and carried. You want to account for the fact that when running in the cold, you actually consume more calories than you would when running Mm, in the warm, simply because your body... Exactly. The opportunity for more cheese. Uh, Your body is uh, spending more of the calories burned on heat to keep you warm and therefore uh, more calories are burned. Uh, Hydration is an issue because the drier air, now this obviously doesn't count for people who are running in warmer climates, but when it's cold, uh, the drier air uh, takes a lot more moisture out of uh, your body and therefore you need to hydrate better. And then visibility, of course, when you're running in the dark, there are all kinds of reflective clothing. There are light vests, there are uh, head lamps that you can wear. And then for footing, just make sure if you are running on icy or snowy uh, ground that uh, you either have some kind of uh, yak tracks or something on your shoes or you're running in trail shoes, or at least you're careful because uh, the, the worst thing to have happen, of course, is to go down and result in an injury that keeps you out of training for any amount of time simply because you stepped on some black ice or something that would not be. An yeah, ideal I mean, way honestly, the folks, go. Yeah, it, you know, you can run outside in pretty much any conditions except ice. If there's even a whisper of ice within five year, five miles of your house, don't go outside. Gosh, we've seen so many injuries of ankles and knees and hips just taken out completely for months at a time because of slips on ice. So if it's cold, you can go out as long as your snot doesn't freeze. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and you, there's clothes for that there's headlights for that there's reflective clothing but if there's ice stay inside for sure <laughs> yeah I, I wanted to go back uh, just to the food part because uh, you talked about portion sizes and uh, I know that for me uh, one of the things that I do with the plate uh, it, to make sure that I don't go back over and over. My my wife does a wonderful job with Christmas cookies and she makes all these amazing cookies mm. and I love them all. And so one of the things that I will do is I will either take like, you know, a, a piece of each one or one of each type. And that way I get to sample. And so I don't go back and like end up taking like multiples of each and uh, satisfying myself with like a nibble of each type of cookie often does the job for me to make sure that I don't uh, go back over and over. Of course, over the course of the day, I, I end up with multiple <laughs> plates, which remains a problem, <laughs> but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Cookies Anonymous. Yeah. So, so we have a, 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 an oversized, um, uh, wine glass essentially with a Santa hat on top. And from December one on, it is filled with Hershey's kisses or M&Ms or, you know, dove chocolates or something like that. And, um, so my, and it's just right there, right? So my sort of rules to myself on that, similar to your cookie rules, is like, you just got to create all these rules, right? <laughs> and are, um, okay, I'm not dipping in before 2 PM <laughs> and then <laughs> I'm only allowed one an hour until 8 PM. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> or, <laughs> And we are nothing if not disciplined and rules oriented in triathlon. So it should work. Exactly. 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 So whatever your, your weakness is with, I think your cookies sound amazing. We, if we don't have that so much in my house, but um, yeah, there's oh so many good things. So maybe put a time limit on it or put a kitchen timer on with a buzzer or, you know, I also would put things. Here's another thing I'll do is I'll put stuff way up high in a kitchen cabinet. So the extra effort to get the footstool to climb up to that cabinet to get the treat, <laughs> it might be enough to defer me. So you can create all kinds of obstacles for yourselves, your people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the last hack that I have is uh, related to drafting your team uh, into your sport. Now, uh, I have talked many times about how triathlon is a team sport and how you need the support of your spouse and your, if you have them, children. And, and getting into this sport, it, well, as selfish as it is and as much of it is, as it is an individual sport, you can't do it without the support of everybody around you. Uh, I have found over the years that if I could encourage my wife and my kids to get into running and biking and into these other things, that uh, it was a lot easier for me to convince them to allow me to train and race. 
holidays. And so what I have done over the years is for Hanukkah gifts or for Christmas gifts, I will slip in a little sport related thing. So uh, mm. one year, uh, my kids got a Garmin watch. Uh, each, uh, not not one wow. of the pricier ones, but like you know, a, right. a forerunner twenty five. Uh, just to you know, they were they were already interested in doing some running, and so I got them each a forerunner twenty five. They like nice. that, and suddenly they wanted to run more. Uh, mm. Then uh, got my wife like running gloves and a running hat, and uh, then it was now my kids bike a lot, and so suddenly biking stuff. Biking jerseys and biking uh, bib shorts show up under the Christmas tree. And nice. all of a sudden, uh, it gives you this opportunity to kind of draft them to be more and more involved in the sport that you enjoy. And before you know it, you uh, can train on the weekends because my kids are older now. You could train on the weekends with your family as opposed to having to leave them at home. And it makes it a lot easier. That is an excellent hack. Although I would recommend as an overall life strategy that you start that hack when they're about six because if you wait until they're in their 20s it's going to be too late <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah no this has been a long-term plan this this Very started clever. a while ago and i i'm yeah. I'm reaping what i sowed uh, at this point now because uh my son is although i can't run with my son anymore he's too fast but <laughs> at least uh, uh, i can yeah. still bike with him for now we'll see how long that lasts well, uh, do you have uh, any uh, big plans for uh, the holiday this year, Juliet? Nope. I am just recovering from the third of three surgeries. So I am bringing this to you from my bed where my leg is above my heart. So there will be no plans over the holidays um, besides uh, I think I've ordered in all the food. <laughs> this is going to be a very chill holiday. So no particular plans. Staying around here. My family's coming to me. What about you? Well, just before I answer that, I mean, I guess that also limits your ability to get to the cheese plate. <laughs> well, that is a factor. I didn't want to get too much into the details, but it is a long trip on crutches down my stairs to the kitchen. So if I just don't go downstairs until 2 p.m., we're way ahead of the game here. Although on the flip side of that, the opportunity for caloric burn is also way down because I'm not doing anything. So <laughs> what, are you doing anything for the holidays? <laughs> The life of the emergency physician means working a holiday, and this year I am working Christmas, but uh, my daughter is coming back from university, so she will be here this weekend, and we will get to uh, spend the holidays with her. Over New Year's, we'll be up uh, at our place in Breckenridge doing some skiing, so uh, yeah, it's going to be a nice holiday, and then my wife and I are off on a uh, diving underwater photography adventure come the new year. So I'll have more to say about that on the next episode. But um, for now, uh, let me let me just wish you a very happy holiday, a, a, a lovely Hanukkah just finished, and a, a Merry Christmas to come. And it's been a pleasure doing the medical mailbag with you. I look forward to a lot more to come. In, uh, that, well, we have one more episode this year, and of course, going into 2024. Me too. Thanks, Jeff. This has been fun. Jason Curtis is a highly experienced strength and conditioning coach and best-selling author who has published over a dozen books on the development of health, fitness, and sports performance. He owns and runs a strength and conditioning gym in the United Kingdom and works with hundreds of clients and athletes each week. Alongside the gym, Jason is the founder of the Strength and Conditioning Coaching Academy, which has qualified and upskilled over 20,000 fitness professionals and enthusiasts worldwide. Today, however, Jason is taking a moment out of his busy life to join me from England, and he is here to talk about the importance of strength and conditioning for triathletes as we head into our off-season and here in the Northern Hemisphere at least get ready to start ramping down the volume of our endurance training and hopefully incorporate more strength and conditioning. Jason, thanks so much for joining me on the TriDoc Podcast. No worries at all. It's great to, great to be on. Uh, I was having a look at your uh, website a little bit earlier today, and I saw there that you've developed numerous strength and conditioning plans for athletes coming from different sports, like rugby, soccer, baseball, for example. I'm curious, how do those programs differ from one another? Is it just a matter of targeting different muscles based on the sport that's being done, or are you actually changing up the programs based on what athletes from each of those sports might be looking for? Yeah, so basically... To give a bit of backstory on that sort of model that I created was I wanted to create programs for various different sports. And I obviously, because I published various books, I was going to publish them as paperbacks, as well as, you know, giving away the, or selling the, the e-books or the PDFs online. 
So I came up with a brand called Paperback Programs, which was a series of books. And I came up with the idea of, right, let's, let's develop a program. So a, a 12 week program for over a hundred sports. And it started really as, as a sort of challenge to myself as an SNC coach to develop these programs. Now, what's interesting is when I've discussed this with other coaches, some people sort of joke, joked about the fact that you could essentially create a sort of stock SNC program, which worked the fundamentals. So it was, if you think about the fundamentals of movement, you've got squat, single leg or lunge, hinge, push, pull. Right, so if, if you want to develop strength, you could do nothing but a barbell back squat, a barbell deadlift, a barbell bench press, and then a few assistance exercises thrown in, like a single leg exercise, like a Bulgarian split squat, or rear for elevated split squat, you know, dumbbell presses. From there, if you want to develop the fundamentals of, of speed, you can just do, you know, basic sprint work and any sort of endurance work, you know, just adds on to that with, you know, your basic running or cardio in the gym. So essentially you could get away with creating quite a stock strength and conditioning program and saying this is beneficial to athletes, especially when it comes to the strength side, because basics done well when it comes to strength is often best, especially because you can get quite an experienced athlete um, that's quite a novice in the gym. So when they come to the gym, regardless of how specific they feel their training needs to be, most of the time they actually need basics done well, you know, rather than really hyper-specific exercises. But that being said, because I saw it as a challenge to me in terms of, right, let's create paperback programs for over a hundred sports. And this is obviously a multi-decade, a decade sort of plan. What I wanted to do with each paperback was to first do a fuller needs analysis of the sport and then the athlete, which is, this is the protocol of any strength and conditioning coaches. First thing first, needs analysis, assess the demands of the sport, assess the, the needs of the athlete, what they need to, to, to do well in that sport. Then the second step was establish a testing battery. So what tests would be relevant according to the needs analysis? So, you know, what sort of strength attributes do they need? What speed, what power, what levels of fitness as a whole, like anaerobic, aerobic, for example. From there, from the testing battery, it's looking at, right, what is the ideal exercise selection for that athlete? And obviously because I am trying to sell a program for say a basketball player, or for a triathlete, which hasn't been done yet, or a cyclist or a runner, there is going to be a slight lean towards specificity. So even though we don't want to lean too hard in the general phase of a program, which these are more geared towards general strength and conditioning rather than very sort of specific, you're going to have that lean towards the exercises that are seen as more specific. So what I also like to do was I jumped on interviews with coaches from them sports. So one of the ones that I'm developing at the moment is a rowing program. So I jumped on with like a GB rowing coach and just spoke to him about all the exercises he felt that the sport needed. And what I always found from S and C coaches were always very much, very much general. So they're like, right, squat, bench, deadlift, fundamentals. When you speak to the sports coaches that don't necessarily have as much of a background in S and C, they're always sort of hyper specific. They really think about the movements that they're doing in the sport and what they need to, to then develop it. So that was quite interesting, really. Yeah, and I gather if you're developing these programs for 100 different sports, you obviously feel like I do, that strength and conditioning should be an integral part of training, no matter what sport you're doing. What is your kind of thought process, or what, what is your belief that strength and conditioning confers to athletes, no matter what sport that they're doing? So I think the, the easiest one isn't even a performance-based one. So the easiest way to sort of get buying from athletes is injury prevention in my eyes. So first thing first, if you're going to be running, now running causes more injuries than most other sports, which is a crazy stat when you think about combat sports and rugby and stuff like that. And a lot of the time it's just overuse as we know. So the amount of runners that get, you know, shin pain, Achilles problems, knee problems, hip problems. And we know that, you know, all the data shows this, that strength training is the real fundamental key to preventing these injuries, you're building strength in not only the muscles, but also the bones, you know, because you're increasing bone mineral density by loading the body. And you're also developing the tendons. And this isn't just for strength training, this is like plyometric training. So obviously running is plyometric, but if we can overload that in a gym with drop jumps and depth jumps and heavy barbell squats, for example, or deadlifts, 
that you're going to minimize the risk of injury. You're never going to eradicate injury. But that's number one for me, that if I get an endurance athlete that doesn't have that buy-in, I'm going to talk to them about the injury prevention side, that strength is fundamental, you know, because it's, I always explain what mechanical strength is. So when people think strength, they think the amount of force it takes to overcome resistance. They might not think of it like that. They might just think lifting heavier weights. But mechanical strength is the amount of force that a tissue can tolerate before it snaps or breaks. And the way that we build that mechanical strength in our tissues, not just muscles, but like I said, bones and, and tendons and, and other soft tissues, is we load them. And we can do that progressively in the gym. So we build our mechanical strength and therefore them tissues are less likely to break or tear. And, and that's the way I get the initial buy-in. From there, it goes to the performance side where obviously there's going to be a bias, especially in the endurance sports where there's going to be a huge bias towards developing that and they don't want to waste time in the gym where they don't think they're developing their energy systems. But at the end of the day, the stronger you are, the easier it is to produce force and power. And therefore, when I start to discuss with, say, a triathlete about certain tests that might, they might do, for example, on a bike, they might do a functional threshold power test. Well, at the end of the day, if you're a stronger guy, your power output's going to be greater. You know, so if, you, if you're a certain weight and you can put a certain amount of power into that, into that bike, then if you're stronger, it's going to be higher. You're going to be able to hold higher power outputs and there's higher wattage on the bike because you're stronger. And the same applies for the rowing and the same applies for the swimming. At the end of the day, you're going to have a stronger squirt stroke. If you are stronger, it's going to be easier. It's going to require less energy to fuel. What about for women, specifically older women? Do you think about any specific benefits that are conferred by strength and conditioning for women in sport? So strength training for women, I would say you could argue it's more important than men because women can lose up to 20% of bone mineral density during the menopause. So that's a huge amount of bone mass. So they're at risk of, you know, osteopenia, which is the sort of precursor to osteoporosis, where you're losing bone mineral density. It's always a, a cool fact when you talk about, you know, astronauts in space losing the bone mineral density and they realize that it was strength training that was the key. Now, what was interesting about that was it wasn't high rep strength training. So you tend to find a lot of women, a lot of endurance athletes will always lean towards, well, I, if I'm an endurance athlete, I should be doing high reps. And I always say, well, you're building that endurance outside the gym. When you're in the gym, you've come to me to develop strength. So why are you developing strength in an inefficient way, which is like endurance-based resistance training? We want to develop strength, but we know that heavy strength training is what develops the bone mineral density. And the reason why that is, if we're under one G, so, you know, of force as in our gravity, then that's why we have the bone mineral density we do and it decreases as we age. Now, when we load the body heavy, that stimulates our bones to grow denser. And because women are even more susceptible to sort of bone mineral density, so bone loss as they age, it's even more important for women to do the strength training. And also obviously muscle, aside from the bone mineral density, the muscle atrophy. You know, muscle atrophy is something that's a comorbidity to most illnesses and ailments. And it's what we want to stay well away from. Do you find Despite all of these benefits that you've just mentioned, do you find that strength and conditioning is still a harder sell for women than it is for men? Or are you finding that things are changing as women are becoming more attuned to a lot of the things you just said and that women are actually gravitating more to it? Yeah, I think like my, so I, I own and run a strength conditioning gym in the UK and we have more female clients than male clients, probably like a 60-40 split. And there's definitely a lean within female fitness leaning towards like more of the conditioning side, the cardio side, you know, the developing the overall fitness and stripping fat. And, and there's definitely a slight bias toward on the male side of like powerlifting, weightlifting, building muscle. The main problem that still lingers when it comes to female resistance training is this belief that they're going to get big or they're going to get excessively big. And I always like it. I always say it's the old Arnold Schwarzenegger say when someone says, I want to, I want to strength train, but I don't want want to look like you and he said don't worry you never will and and it's true like people have this belief like even endurance athletes men or women they always say to me oh i don't want to put on too much muscle and i'm like look if you're not eating like some crazy calorie surplus getting in a huge amount of protein strength training three or four times a week 
and not minimizing cardio, but your overall activity level is not so high that it's, it's thrown you into a deficit or just a maintenance. Like, and you're worried about gaining too much muscle. That's just crazy to me because the amount of younger men that are eating like dirty bulks, as we call it, you know, they're throwing everything they can into the mouth. They're doing zero cardio. Their strength training six days a week and they still struggle to get a chest on. They still struggle to build the biceps because building muscle is really hard. So the ideal, the idea that that female that's lifting weights two or three times a week is probably on a maintenance. A lot of them are on a deficit because they're trying to lose fat. The idea that they're going to gain muscle that's going to impede them or be negative to them is just silly. So they'll always say, I want to tone, I don't want to build muscle. And that's a little bit of a, people don't really understand what muscle tone is in, in essence. It's, I always say to people that, you know what, so you come to the gym to make your muscles more tense and then you go for a massage to release that tension for you. And we're talking about muscle tonicity, you know, because what you actually want is you want to build muscle mass. You do want fibular hypertrophy. You want to develop the contractile components of the muscle. So them sarcomeres and you want to strip the fat. The reason your muscles feel wobbly is not because they lack the tension really. It's because there's not enough muscle there and there's too much fat. So you absolutely want to strip fat and you absolutely want to build as much muscle mass as you can because you're not going to build an amount of muscle mass that you're unhappy with. And that's something that I don't just push to women. I also push that to the endurance athletes, the male and female endurance athletes that have a sort of fear of gaining too much muscle, which is very unlikely. Yeah, you've made a couple of really excellent points and things that I say to my athletes frequently, it's not about getting big, it's about getting strong. And you've mentioned how getting strong can be so helpful, not just in injury mitigation, but also just in being a stronger, faster athlete. I feel also that it adds resilience, especially in our athletes who do these long events like half Ironmans or Ironmans when they're out there for a really long time. Having strength is been shown to, to impact whether or not you develop muscle cramps and also can play a role in just your ability to go faster later in a race because you're stronger, more resilient. I am interested, though, you mentioned something about lifting more for fewer reps. And that is not something I've heard consistently from different strength and conditioning coaches. I've heard uh, two different kind of uh, approaches. There's lift more for fewer reps. And then I've also heard lift a little bit less for more reps. And I thought it was really interesting what you said that if you're lifting less for more reps, that's more of an endurance approach versus a strength approach, which would be to lift more for, for fewer reps. And I think that's probably where a lot of athletes get confused, that if they're lifting big, big, heavy things, even if it's for fewer reps, that's where they are themselves going to get big. Could you explain why the discrepancy there or why the different approach from different coaches about reps and amount of weight? Yeah, so first things first, what I need to clear up is that basically the, the problem with a lot of people's questions reference rep ranges and set ranges and stuff is they want a one key rep range that is key for them. And actually I'm, a, I'm under the belief that you should undulate and you can use what's called linear periodization where you have higher volume to start and then it progresses to low volume, high intensities, you know, so starting, for example, with 10 reps, and then it goes down to eight, six, five, four, three, two, one over many weeks. But I actually prefer undulation where you, you change from higher volumes to lower volumes. So it's not just key to lift heavy for few reps, it's key to cycle in different rep ranges to build different attributes within the program. So you're having that higher rep ranges to build resilience in the tissues, muscular endurance, and you've got the lower rep ranges to build the strength. And that's what creates a far more well-rounded program. However, when it comes to building strength in athletes, now we know that it's, it's the set principle, specific adaptation to imposed man. If you want to get stronger, then if you want to get faster, you run fast. If you want to build endurance, you run for a long time. If you want to build strength, you lift heavy. So the idea of just staying too submaximal and lifting moderate loads, you will not elicit the adaptation that you're looking for the strength. So yes, if you lift really heavy all the time, so heavy, I call anything above 85%. So the Russian sports scientist, Zadimir Zatsiorsky class maximum strength as above 90% of your one rep max. So the most you can lift for one rep. Now we know that you will get stronger if you're lifting above these percentages. So you're into the 90% of your one rep max. And for that amount of weight, you're only going to be doing one, two, maybe three reps within a set. 
but that is going to elicit the biggest strength developments. However, the injury risk is obviously higher and you don't want to be doing it all the time. Just like you wouldn't want to be doing a long run all the time, or you wouldn't want to be sprinting every single day. It's you, your injury risk would go up. So yes, we need to do the low rep ranges to elicit the strength. But one of the benefits of this as well is especially when you're not necessarily off season where you can spend a little bit more time in the gym is if you're performing low reps for high weight, it's actually going to have a lot of the time less recovery cost because if you're performing a lot of eccentric contractions and steady eccentric contractions at moderate loads, then you're going to get more muscle soreness from that, more muscle trauma because it's the eccentric phase that elicits all that sort of micro trauma to the muscles that causes the inflammation and the soreness the next day. So although the heavy weights are going to cause like a little bit of neuro fatigue, which is, you know, a sort of debated topic, you're going to feel tired from lifting heavy. When you do sets of say 12, 15 reps, there's loads of eccentric phase. So loads of dropping down into squat, coming back up, dropping down into squat, doing that 12 times is actually going to fall, cause more muscle soreness than doing two reps of a really heavy weight where there's more demand in the neuromuscular system to bring that weight up, but there's actually less sort of demand on the tissues as they work eccentrically. So they're lengthening under tension. So yes, I would actually say that you want more of the higher rep stuff further away from when you're doing competitions or, or sort of important training sessions on the bike, swimming or running. However, as you get closer, you want to be changing it up to being lifting heavier and not doing as many reps, which actually counterintuitively reduces the recovery cost, unless it's absolutely maximal and it's just riding you off a little bit. So that's really fascinating and that makes a ton of sense to me. It's not something I've tried personally. I will take your advice and I'm going to try and incorporate that because that was going to be my next question related to why so many endurance athletes are often afraid of doing strength training, it's because they often feel sore afterwards and that impacts their ability to go out and then train either in the pool or on the bike or running because they're too sore from the effort or the the uh, the strength training session that they did yesterday. And your suggestion is, is that by lifting for less reps with heavier weights, it can actually mitigate that, which I find really, really almost counterintuitive. But the way you explain it makes a lot of sense that the, it's that eccentric loading phase that results in soreness and not not the the, the lifting phase, uh, which you're doing with a heavier weight that's, that's more. Do you have your athletes do, when you say two reps of a heavy weight, is it one set or are they repeating that set? They would often repeat, so it depends on the session, but they would often repeat that, but it would be, you know, one to three sets and we're wanting quality, you know, so when it comes to true strength training, it's all about quality. It's not about adding in loads of volume. One thing I'd say about muscle soreness for people that worry about getting quite sore, you know, within the season or as their training starts to ramp up, what that normally tells me is they, they're introducing a new stress. So the, what you need to do within any annual program, when you look at your training year, you need to identify times within that year where your training is maybe a little bit less important in terms of there's no important competitions or really important training sessions that you're trying to push on. And you need to introduce these stresses because what causes soreness above all else, obviously we know it's the eccentric phase more so than the concentric phase, which is as you're shortening the muscles to, to finish the lift. What causes muscle soreness is a spike in intensity, volume, so the amount of frequency you're doing or a different stressor. So if you've not played football in a while, you're going to be really sore. If you've not done single leg movements in a while, you're going to be really sore. Now, if you can identify a period within your annual program, for example, so just, you know, your calendar, not getting too technical, just look at the year and go, right, after Christmas, January, February, we're just going to be building volume, ramping up, there's time here to put a little bit of time into the gym, condition the muscles. So that's a key component of strength conditioning. So get the muscles resilient and used to squatting with a barbell or a kettlebell, doing like stiff leg deadlifts or deadlifts, doing the bench press or the overhead press. So you're conditioning the muscles. So when it comes into the main program where things are ramping up on the bike, the swimming, the running, you're conditioned to this and you're not getting the soreness. So actually you built up volume with higher rep sets You've done lots of eccentric loading to condition the tissues. 
Then when you're getting on the bike and you're hitting, you know, harder, you can then lower the reps down and you're not going to experience the muscle soreness that you would have experienced throwing strength training in at that point because you're already conditioned. And then low rep sets aren't going to create that muscle soreness because you've, developed, you've ramped up progressively to that level of intensity. And I assume recovery is a big part of this as well. And I don't mean recovery between sessions. I mean recovery between sets. So you've lifted, you know, 80% of your Mac, a couple of squats, for example, you're going to do a second set. I imagine you need a good lengthy recovery period in order to, to be able to do that second set. Yes. Is that accurate? Yeah. So most people in the gym will do like sort of 60 seconds is like a recovery if they're doing bicep curls or something like that. But if you're doing a primary lift, so... What would be the main lift of the session? You could have two or three of them. You know, it could you could just base your training around the big lifts like the squats, the the presses, the deadlifts, what we call like hinge exercises. So yeah, if you were working above seventy five percent, for example, I'm taking two to three minutes rest. Elite strength athletes will go beyond five minutes. I don't think endurance athletes would would ever feel the need to do that. You know, that their max strength up, they might be really strong, but you know, they're not a a, a world class strongman. Most of the time, two to three minutes is around optimal. And you don't have to be crazy strict. Make sure it's at least a couple of minutes so you're letting your sort of nervous system recharge. But it's about just feeling ready for the next set. That's another point to reiterate. We're not trying to build our work capacity, our ability to recover whilst lifting weights. We are training our ability to produce force, full contractions, whether that be, you know, just maximal force or powerful contraction. We're not trying to then minimize recovery time. So you take as much rest as you can. And a lot of endurance athletes will feel like they can go again quite fast because their cardiorespiratory system is so good. And that's why it's also important for strength athletes to do that style of training. Because if, you're not card if you don't have the cardio fitness, you actually will take longer rest periods just because you're unfit. So it's key for the endurance athletes to take that recovery. Another thing I'd say on in terms of strength training for endurance athletes. I don't program sort of single muscle group days. So you wouldn't do a lower body day and then an upper body day. If you were doing like a two day split across the week, both sessions would be total body. So you, the first session, for example, would have a bilateral squat, so like a barbell back squat, and then it might go into a hinge exercise like an RDL, then it would go into upper body. The second session might be a deadlift into a single leg exercise, into pressing and pulling again. So rather than doing four or five exercises on the lower body, which is going to, again, accumulate a lot of volume, a lot of eccentric loading, I would split the session down to be, you know, quad heavy lift, hamstring heavy lift, maybe a bit of calves. Then it would be like a pressing heavy lift and then a pulling heavy lift. So you're obviously pressing sort of chest, triceps, shoulders, pulling's obviously the back, the biceps, stuff like that. So I would target the entire body in the strength session, which is also going to mitigate the, the muscle soreness and the overall fatigue on any muscle. And what are your thoughts about like supersets where during the rest period for one exercise, you actually do a different exercise? So for example, you're doing squats and you pair that with bench press. press. Yes, that, that's absolutely fine. I mean, the main benefit of a superset is that it saves time. So if someone, if someone wants to same time in the gym, they need to get more into their session. They need to increase the density of the session. So density is about how much you're getting done within that time. Then supersets are great. And if you like training that has, you know, more intensity and it builds a little bit more work capacity, then supersets are really good. There's different styles of supersets as well, where you could do bench press into fly, which is the same muscle group. Then you've also got agonist and antagonist muscle, uh, supersets where you do, for example, bench press into row. So you're doing opposing muscle groups and then you've got like upper lower supersets where you can do like squat into a pressing exercise. They're really good and I highly recommend them. However, if your aim is to maximize the output on the individual exercise, then I wouldn't do supersets because I would want, if I want to maximize my leg strength, I would do a set of squats. I'd then recover. I'd then do the next set of squats and I'd optimize that. However, if I want, if I knew I was wanting to train my upper and lower body I, and I didn't have as much time, then I'd combine supersets. So supersets are great and they have the benefits, but they are going to 
diminish the overall output on any given exercise if you're starting to increase the workout, you know? So it's just sort of factoring that. Yeah, this is terrific information, Jason. It's really great. I'm sure our listeners are going to appreciate it. I want to finish with just a few minutes that we have left just to hear a little bit about your Instagram feed. It's very popular. You do a lot of fun stuff on there. Tell us a little bit about where people can find you and what they can expect to find when they follow you. So you can find my Instagram through Coach Jason Curtis. It's also the name of it, Strength and Conditioning Course. But at Coach Jason Curtis, it will come up. That's that's myself. And basically, we we... We grew quite fast in the last year or so because I am obviously a, a writer. I've published just over 20 books now, <laughs> excuse me. And I realized that when it, when it came to me doing my Instagram, I had a few feeds. I realized that my video content was, wasn't, you know, the, 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 the production value was, wasn't that great. I, me personally, I didn't think I was that great in front of the camera. Everyone within the fitness industry seemed to produce sort of the similar content. It was either really good, well-designed infographics, or it was really good video content, or pictures of themselves and they're in great shape or they're really good looking, Yeah, which I'm not. So I thought, well, how can I do it differently? And I thought one thing that I'm all right at is writing. And I write sort of long form content, but it's, it's simplified. So rather than throwing it into an infographic that I think a lot of people do very well, you know, it's almost like the graphic designers, they put these camera and everything like that. I just started to create PowerPoint presentations where actually if you were to look at it, you'd think, oh, the text is too small. It's, you know, the image at the side. So I would create sort of like a 20 page PowerPoint presentation. I would then save it as a PDF. I'd open it on my phone and I'd screenshot every two slides. So these slides took up a lot of real estate on Instagram because they were, they were larger than the one by one. But looking at them as a graphic design, you'd think they're not that well designed, like I said, because the text is small. But I think it hit a Goldilocks zone between it wasn't like buying a textbook. It was simplified content, but it was a lot more, considerably more than like an infographic. So it hit sort of a market that wasn't as, you know, it just hadn't been hit before. And I did my first one was actually a training program and I just put follow and comment below for a free copy of this program and I thought there's going to be like one or two people even though it's a free 12 week program I was like there'd be one or two people because people just don't engage it's really hard to get real engagement but it got like 400 comments so I, I had to message everyone with a Dropbox link with that and it took me oh, it took ages it was horrendous and I thought that's a fluke so I did one that was you know more of a it was like right 20 squat variations, I'll write about each one. So it's really sort of mid four, mid length, sort of written content, wasn't that well designed. Did it again, hundreds of comments, everyone wanted to download it. So I was like, I'm onto something here. So I basically, over the last year, have created over probably about 300 different ebooks that cover topics from endurance training, energy systems, how to develop strength for cycling to squat variations, how to prevent injuries, everything you can think of within strength and conditioning. I do like, it's anywhere from 10 pages up to 300. So one of them's a mobility ebook. It's over 300 pages and it's just every stretch and rolling drill I could think of put into one ebook. And basically what I do is I've automated it now, which is linked to Instagram. So I'm not breaking any rules because I just couldn't keep up with the messaging people. So when I post an ebook, which I do, usually about three times a week now and just because I'm quite busy you comment on the post and it sends you the ebook and you get it for free and there's there's no and if you comment on any post that I've ever put up it will send you the ebook and, and there's literally hundreds and hundreds of ebooks and it's just free free education obviously it benefits me because it grows my audience I also have an online academy I, I write and sell books so it's it's great marketing but what it's turned into is like a massive um a massive educational resource and we've got over a hundred thousand followers now because of it so it's it's something i'm quite proud of and you should be that's outstanding jason it's really you've, you've built quite a a little thing you've got there and i have to say i could see why i could see why people are gravitating towards you because you're clearly incredibly knowledgeable you're basing things on a very 
you know, a, a breadth of knowledge that you've, you've gained over many, many years in this area and it shows and I could see how you're helping people. Uh, well, Jason Curtis, I'm going to include all of the links for where you can find him, including his Instagram feed that he just mentioned, as well as his website. So if you're interested in learning more about what he's doing and about how you can avail yourself of many of his different programs that he has out there, you will be able to find them in the show notes for the program today. Jason, I can't thank you enough for joining me on the TriDoc Podcast. This has been a really fascinating conversation, and I wish you the best of luck with all of your endeavors in the future. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And that's it for another episode. The TriDoc Podcast is produced and edited by me, Jeff Sankoff, along with my interns. I'm Agent Johnson. This is Special Agent Johnson. Oh, how you doing? No relation. I'm, uh... I'm Jeff Sankoff, uh, the, the TriDoc. I'm in charge here. Not anymore. Those interns are Ian Johnson and Ben Johnson. You can find the show notes for everything discussed on the show today, as well as archives of previous episodes at tridocpodcast.com. Do you have questions about any of the issues discussed on this episode, or do you have a question that you'd like for me to consider answering on a future episode? Send me an email at tri underscore doc at icloud.com, or join the private TriDoc Podcast Facebook group on Facebook, and you can submit your questions there. If you're interested in coaching services, please visit tridoccoaching.com or lifesportcoaching.com, where you can find a lot of information about me and the services that I provide. You can also follow me on the TriDoc Podcast Facebook page, TriDoc Coaching on Instagram, and the TriDoc Coaching YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this podcast, I hope that you'll consider leaving me a rating and a review, as well as subscribe to the show wherever you download it. And of course, there's always the option of becoming a supporter of the podcast at patreon.com forward slash TriDoc Podcast. The music heard at the beginning and the end of the show is Radio by Empty Hours and is used with permission. This song and many others like it can be found at ReverbNation.com, where I hope that you'll visit and give small independent bands a chance. The TriDoc Podcast will be back again soon with another medical question for me to answer and another interview with someone in the world of multisport. Until then, remember 1121 and train hard, train healthy.